Well, good morning and welcome to the live stream of the United Methodist Church. We want to say welcome and a big hello to all of our, our online campus uh, from coast to coast and, and people, uh, especially in Hiawatha, want to give you all a big shout out. We want you to know that we love you. And if you're ever in Dallas, come give us a visit. We'd love to see you in person. And uh, also, of course, we want to say hello to everyone down in New Orleans. Pastor Hadley, we hope you're doing well. We can't wait to see you again soon. Pastor Tom, we hope you're having a great sabbatical. And, um, and we're just hoping you're getting some rest. We're excited to have you back later this fall. If you're new to the Preston Hollow family, we don't believe it's an accident that you clicked on whatever buttons that you clicked on that you're hearing this message right now. I want you to know that today we really believe that you will be encouraged and blessed uh, by uh, this message and, and, the, and the service and all the worship. We want you to know that we don't want anything from you. We just want you to sit back and we just hope you'll listen to our message with an open heart and and open eyes today. If you're new to our family, we'd like to encourage you to, to text us. I promise we won't blow up your phone, just maybe one or two a month. It's just a great way for us to be connected. And you can simply text us to the number to 97000, type in the words P-H-U-M-C, and we'll send you a simple little welcome. Also, uh, we're right in the middle of a series on the Lord's Prayer. We are a church family that believes in prayer. And we want you to know if you are going through something or you have a friend or family member that's uh, maybe in a difficult situation right now and they need prayer, we want you to email us. Oh, it's real simple. You just uh, uh, email us prayer at umcprestonhollow.com and we'll, uh, uh, we'll get your email. We will respond uh, within uh, minutes, uh, if not earlier, and uh, let you know uh, that we're thinking about you and we'll send out your prayer need to our prayer teams and uh, we'll keep those of course confidential but if you have anything on your heart please uh, do email us today well we're excited today we're in the fifth week of our series of the Lord's Prayer I'm so excited today is and lead us not into temptation and so yes we're talking about sin isn't this gonna be fun today all right well before we get into it uh, Russ Rieger and our chancel choir and our musicians have got some great things we have some new music Music today that we're going to be sharing with you. We are so excited. I want to say thank you to our, our entire production team. They've worked very hard this last week, filmed for three hours this last Sunday. So I want to say thank you to Bryce and to Catherine and to Noah and Joel, the whole team. Thank you for all your hard work. And now let's worship together. Thank you. 
All right, prayer. All earthly things with earth will fade away, but prayer grasps eternity. But I'm convinced of this, God does not hear prayer. He hears desperate prayer. Prayer is not a position, whether you need. Prayer is not a position, it's a disposition. You get to the place where you'd rather sweat, you'd rather weep in his presence than laugh in anybody else's presence. You'd rather God whisper a secret into your heart that breaks you than somebody give you the prizes that all the world covets. Prayer is almost the greatest human privilege that we have. Thank you. 
Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day of daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us. As we forgive the ones who sin against us. Forgive them and lead us not into temptation. But well, good morning, and thank you for joining us today. I'm so excited as we're continuing in our series on the Lord's Prayer. Uh, this is the fifth week uh, in the series, and uh, I hope you're enjoying it as much as uh, I have. If you've missed the last five weeks, four weeks, um, I just want to just want to recap. You know, we started with our Father. That, that talks about that He is our Father. He's the Father of the Jews. He's the Father of the Muslims. He's the Father of the people that you don't like. He's the Father of the Democrats, or He's the Father of the Republicans. He is our Father, which makes us all His children. Then the next line was, Who art in heaven? Talks about He is the universe. He created every star, 158 billion light years. Uh, his, the universe is in His arms, but yet He is as close as the breath that you breathe. And then hallowed be thy name, separating us from him, that he is magnificent and omnipotent, and we are, are not God, and he is. And then thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Talking about when we pray, we can't make, play let's make a deal with God. We have to, we tell him our hearts, we tell him our concerns, but at the end of the prayer we have to say, but thy will, I trust you, God, with my prayer. And then on earth as it is here as it is in heaven. Then give us this day our daily bread. We have the Life Pack kids here. If you remember that, we have an opportunity to be able to feed homeless people. Give us this, this, this day our daily bread. That means that we are to help others physically who need food. But also, uh, Jesus says that I am the bread of life. So I had that double entendre there. Then also, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And that talks about this. If you want forgiveness, you have to forgive. Jesus says, if you don't forgive people, my heavenly father will not forgive you. That was pretty serious stuff. Which brings us to today. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I heard a story about four guys that went to a church retreat and uh, the, the guys went to their, their, their room and they had to have these round table discussions. And they were talking about temptation and the things that they struggle with. So they asked the first guy, well, what do you, you struggle with? And he's like, well, it's a little hard for me to admit, but I, I want you all to know that I do struggle with lust. It's something that's very, very difficult for me. They went to the next guy and he said, well, um, it's tough for me, but I... I think I have a gambling problem. I love to go to uh, uh, Choctaw or to uh, the casinos in Oklahoma, and I'll have a good, good time, but I probably gamble a little too much, and, and I, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a problem. One of the other guys said, well, I have to tell you, I enjoy to probably have a little too many drinks. It's hard for me after two or three drinks just to stop, and I, I drink too much. 
they got to the fourth guy and he was sitting at the table and he was on his phone and just didn't even act interested in what was going on around the table. And they asked him, hey, uh, what are you tempted by? And he said, well, I'm tempted by gossip. I really struggle with it. In fact, I've been on Twitter and Facebook posting all this stuff about you guys ever since you started talking. This is really juicy stuff. And I've been posting it. Uh, uh, yeah. So, yeah, listen, off. Oh, first of all, uh, church, I want you to know that there's two things that I've learned that Methodists that just don't like to talk about. One, they don't like to talk about the blood. We never sing songs with the word blood in it. And the other thing that Methodists don't like to talk about is sin. We just don't like to talk about it, and I get it. But we have this problem because Jesus gave us a prayer that we say as Methodists 52 Sundays a year, and in that prayer, unfortunately for you and for me, it mentions that we have to deal with sin. So since Jesus mentioned this, we can't simply ignore. And so you ready? Let's dive in together, okay? Well, listen, we are all tempted all the time. It's part of life. It's a part of the human condition, which is why Jesus said the Lord's Prayer. And he only gives us a handful of lines to pray. But among those, he says, I want you to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So this is meant to be a part of our everyday life. It was said that Martin Luther, he was the Protestant reformer. He, it was known that he prayed one part of the prayer early in the morning and the other portion when he went to bed in the evening. In the evening before he went to bed, he prayed, forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Because he recognized that throughout the course of his day, he recognized that he had fallen short of God's will and that he had strayed from the path. We learned that Sin means to miss the mark, and he missed the mark, and so he would ask for forgiveness, and so he would wake up in the morning, and he would always say, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So forgiveness and asking God to get us on the right path, and well, that's the rhythm of the Christian life. Now, we're all tempted and temptations that, that lure, where we feel that hunger or for that longing for something that either we know is wrong or something simply that we don't want to do. So sometimes the object of our desire isn't necessarily something that's morally wrong. It may be something that we're choosing not to do. I was thinking uh, about dieting. My, my doctor recently this year put me on high cholesterol pills. So this week I thought, you know what? I'm going to try and, and lose a little bit of weight. And more importantly than losing weight, just simply eating better foods and being a little bit healthier. So on Wednesday when I came up to the church, um, I, I stopped by Central Market and I picked up a salad. I honestly was going to even just eat like half of the salad and give the other half to Cody, but I ended up eating the entire thing by myself, and I still was pretty hungry. And here's what I found this week as I started this new diet. Suddenly, I had this terrible hunger to eat things that I usually wouldn't even be normally hungry for. Have you ever noticed how things look and sound better now that you're not supposed to eat them? When I was leaving Central Market that day, right here by the church, there's a McDonald's in the parking lot right in front of it. And as I was driving by, I saw this giant semi truck that was unloading food. And there was a picture of a Big Mac and a quarter pounder and French fries coming off of it. And as I drove by, I could even smell the, 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 the grease or, uh, the, from the restaurant. Then that night on TV, for whatever reason, I'm watching, uh, I never notice food commercials. I just don't even think about it. And I haven't been to an Applebee's in like 15 years, yet I was looking at their steak. They had an advertisement for this big juicy steak for like $13. If you bought that steak, you could add 10 pieces of shrimp for only a dollar. I was like, oh my gosh, I, I want to go get that steak and not that shrimp. Let me remind you, this is the first day of my diet. Now, it wouldn't, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have been a sin for me to go and have those things, but it was a choice that I was making not to do that because I was trying to lose some weight and to eat healthier. So this is how it works, though. When there's a rule that's put up before us, and the rule may not have anything really to do with sin, but when there's a rule that's been put up before us, suddenly we want the thing we're not supposed to have. So I asked you a couple of weeks ago, when the speed limit is 55, how fast do you go? I remember most people said 65. 65 is what I heard the most. 
So you're driving about 20% faster than the speed limit. And why do we do that? It's totally about the sign, right? Now listen, what if the speed limit sign said 65? How fast do you go? Most of us, yeah, exactly, 75. All right, so we're always in our, our head. We're about 10 miles over the speed limit. Whatever the rule is, we just have a longing to just go a little faster or to do whatever it is we're not supposed to do. That's just how we are as human beings. Now, some temptations are like that. They violate a rule that we set for ourselves that really aren't a big deal. But yet sometimes that longing, that hunger, that lure that we feel inside us is leading us towards something painful or that can be very painful. It could also be painful for other people around us. Sometimes our temptations lead us to painful places. James, the apostle, writes, everyone is tempted by their own cravings. They are lured away and enticed by them. Every single one of us is subject to temptation. Once those cravings conceive, they give birth to sin. And when sin grows, it gives birth to death. So if you're not ever feeling tempted, then you are not alive or you're not paying attention. And that's really dangerous. If you're not really noticing that you're being tempted towards things, this metaphor for con conception and the birth is very powerful. There's an idea that comes across your mind and you either say no to it or you say yes to it. And when you begin to say, well, maybe to it, then you begin to entertain it. It's called the moment of the maybe. You think about the idea in your mind for a while, and then the longer you think about it, the more it has an opportunity to conceive. And finally, you really begin to think about it, and it's taken root in your mind, and you conceive this thing that you're thinking about. Then eventually, you take action towards it, and when finally you cross the line and done that thing you knew that you weren't supposed to, it gives birth, and it gives birth to sin. And so you've missed the mark of what God had for you. And when that has continued to, de to develop, it's born or, or whatever, that missing that mark that you did, it leads to death. And now death may not be physical death, while certainly some things can, but it might be spiritual death or the death of relationships or hopes or dreams. It's interesting how the Bible starts with stories of temptations. Genesis 1 through 3, it's a foundational story. It's, it's not the story about a long time ago. It's our story. It's our story of temptation. We find human beings tempted to do the thing they weren't supposed to do. Adam and Eve are in the garden and they're given everything possible to eat, drink, all the good things of life God is providing for them. And then God says, it's all for you because I love you. It's a sign of the love that I have for you. But there's just one thing that you can't have. It's just like the speed limit sign. There's this one thing we're told we're not supposed to, to have, but it becomes suddenly the only thing that we most desperately want. And the scripture talks about a serpent in the garden, but this was a walking and talking serpent. And apparently he, after the event of giving in to temptation, this curse for the serpent was for it to slither on the ground. So this is a, a picture of you know, snakes now, but this was a walking and talking serpent who begins to whisper to Adam and Eve. Did God really tell you not to eat the fruit from that tree? I think it's interesting how Genesis describes the serpent. Genesis 3, 1 says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. So it was a creature that God had made, and its role was to test or to tempt. And whether it had taken a wrong turn itself, or maybe this was part of its role in fulfilling its part in the book of Genesis, Nonetheless, it was crafty. The word craft here is the, the Hebrew word for aram, which not only means to be crafty, but it means to be cunning, to be subtle. It means to be capable of persuading. And so this creature was capable of persuading Adam and Eve, of rationalizing with them. And I don't know about you, but if I had seen a 
talking serpent in the, the garden, I think I would have seen a talking snake trying to talk me into something. I'm pretty sure it would have been a no for me. That would not be a temptation for me. But what I have is a voice in my head. And I know what that voice says. It says, hey, you know, this would be really great if you did this. Or think about how awesome it would be if you said or did or acted upon this particular desire. So the voice starts to persuade you. And so whatever you call it, some people think of it as the, the devil or there's this dark force or this shadow self or this evil. There's a, a rationalization that happens for all of us to do evil. And we all know it. And we can come up with a hundred good excuses for why we should do the thing that we know that we shouldn't do. And so we rationalize and the longer we play with that voice, the more rational it seems. When I think about the picture of the serpent in the garden and this whisper that he gives, I'm reminded of the Disney, uh, The Jungle Book that came out in 1964. And there's this snake, it's a python, and his name is Ka. And in the book, his, he's friends with Mowgli, the little boy. But in the movie, uh, he's an enemy of Mowgli and he wants to devour him. And so he lures him and he uses this kind of, he sort of hypnotizes him like this. He has this sort of seductive voice, this mesmerizing character, the, 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 the movement to a place where our resistance is taken away from us completely. And that's the process often for the kind of deadly things that can happen in our lives. If we find ourselves slowly by degrees and being mesmerized by the voice of the dark side. Take a listen to Adam Hamilton. It's interesting when Jesus was tempted, and I really appreciate the fact that in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it tells us that Jesus himself was tempted. So when God came and walked among, the, among us on the earth in the human flesh of Jesus Christ, when he walks among us, he himself was tempted. He was tested. And by the way, the Greek word for tempting and testing is the same word in the New Testament. And so he's in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, and he fasts, and, and then the devil comes to him. How do you think the devil came to Jesus in the wilderness? You think he showed up with a pitchfork and red spandex tights? And of course he didn't. Like, that would be too easy. The devil doesn't show up to us that way. And I'm pretty sure when Jesus was tempted and we read those stories, we're not really seeing a figure standing in front of Jesus. I could be wrong, but I'm thinking that Jesus was tempted just like we are. And that is he hears this voice. He's really hungry and there's stones all around. And, and somewhere the idea comes up, you know, if you use your powers for yourself, like you deserve it, Jesus. Like you've fasted for 40 days, man, this is awesome. Think about that. So think, you know, you could just instantly convert stone into bread and you can eat it. And that's okay. You deserve it, man. You deserve it. And by the way, if you could do this all the time and you just convert stones into bread and you feed people, people will follow you. Dude, you don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to die. You don't have to suffer for people. You just give them bread, just miraculously feed people, and it's going to be fine. Or when the devil took Jesus to the high point of the temple, the pinnacle of the temple, and, and if he were to throw himself down from there, it would be clear that he, you know, would die. He would land and die, and there's a big crowd gathered around the temple, and he says, hey, Jesus, you know, if you just go up there and, and you throw yourself off, like, think about this. If you prove it to people, you prove who you really are, because remember, the scripture says that he will give his angels charge over you and they will, they will collect you and keep your feet from, from, from harm. And so the devil even quotes scripture to Jesus in trying to rationalize with him and persuade him to do the thing he shouldn't do. And, and then people will follow you and you don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to suffer because they're going to follow you because you did a really amazing miracle. And then, of course, the last one. Or, you know, Jesus, if you'll just turn away from the path you've been going and follow my path, I'll give you all the wealth and power you could possibly hope for. You don't have to suffer and die. I'll make your life easy street, man. Right, that's how it worked for Jesus. And of course, Jesus quoted scripture each time and chose not to follow that path. We struggle sometimes as to whether we can resist that path or not. I think about how uh, 1 Peter describes the devil, not as a python wanting to eat Mowgli, but instead as a lion wanting to eat us. And this is what he says, like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. Resist him steadfast in your faith. I love this because even though he's like a roaring lion, you can resist him. 
I used to walk, I watched all the various Star Trek series. Anybody watch Star Trek around here? Some of you did. Well, there was one of those where the uh, Borg, these were like this terrible enemy, you know, who would try to destroy everybody else, and they would say, resistance is futile. But here's the thing, resistance isn't futile when it comes to the devil. You can resist him, and he'll leave. In essence, that's what we're praying for when we're praying this part of the Lord's Prayer. I, I like how Paul talks about the devil or the dark side. When he talks about this, he talks in terms of a battle that's taking place, and then he uses the armament of a Roman soldier to describe how we resist him. He says this, finally, be strengthened by the Lord and his powerful strength. Put on God's armor so that you can, st you can make a stand against the tricks of the devil. So put on God's armor, and, and so this imagery of battle, and then he goes on to describe the armor in, in Ephesians chapter 6. He says, put around your waist a belt, and the belt is the belt of truth. Then put justice as a breastplate. A and then he says, put on shoes that represent you sharing the gospel of peace with other people. Uh, carry the shield, which is your faith, your trust, your absolute trust in God. The helmet of salvation, knowing that you are saved or delivered by God, and he is your savior and deliverer. And then have the sword of the Holy Spirit's power, and God's words buried in your heart. And in these ways, you can resist. You can fight and win this battle. I love this. These are all spiritual disciplines and, and spirituality. It's our, it's our faith that gives us the capacity and the strength to resist when we find ourselves lured into temptation. So recognize the battle we all face is with temptation. At least one of the battles we face is that temptation to do the things we're not supposed to do and not do the things we are supposed to do. And and we've talked about that as both in uh, actions, but it's also in our thoughts and our words. So say that with me. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So a couple of years ago, Pastor Tom, Russ, Kathy, Cody, and I went to see Adam Hamilton in Kansas City, where he really opened our eyes up to something. And honestly, this next point I'm going to teach is the point that changed the meaning of this part of the Lord's Prayer and what inspired me to do this series. So pay really close attention and go with me on this. So at his church, we're there, and during the conference, instead of saying, lead us not into temptation, which is what we say here in our church, they say, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So everyone was asking why they were hesitating in saying it that way. Why not just do it the ordinary way? So he told us he never understood why would we have to pray to the Lord not to lead us into temptation? Have you ever thought about that? Why are we praying, lead us not into temptation? He went on to say, why would God lead us into temptation? And to begin with, and, and if there were some good reason that God would lead us into temptation, then why would God not do it if he had some good reason to do it? So this sentence just doesn't make sense. Why are we praying for God not to lead us into temptation? Listen, God doesn't want to lead us into temptation. That would say that God is trying to lure us away from the right path, where God is actually trying to lead us onto the right path. We read this in James chapter 1, verse 13. No one who is tested or tempted should say, God is tempting me. This is because God is not tempted by any form of evil, more does he tempt anyone. So again, why do we need to pray for God not to lead us into temptation? And so I guess what we're suggesting to you is that God is not leading you into temptation. And this is not what we're praying. I love how in Psalms 23, the psalmist says that he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That's the path that God wants to lead us in. So here's the problem. In the Greek, they didn't use commas or periods or they didn't have any punctuation. So we don't know where the pauses and the stops should be. We just run it all together as a sentence and leave out the pause. But we think in one interpretation years ago, he was right when he suggested the idea that we have a comma in there and we need to put that comma in the right place. The prayer really goes like this. Lead us, comma. That's what I'm praying. Please, Lord, lead us. Lead me. Lead me on the path of righteousness for your name's sake. Lead me in the path you want me to go on. Lead me, Lord. Then after the comma is not into temptation, which is the path I would lead myself. You see how that works? 
I would go into a path of temptation, onto a path of temptation. That's my path, but God's path is different path. It's a different path, so lead me, Lord, not into the path that I want to go, but in the path that you want me to go. I remember when I moved to Dallas in 2000, I moved here from Colorado and I lived in Keller, uh, South Lake area. And I'd never experienced Krispy Kreme donuts in my entire life. First, I was amazed by the big sign that just flashed hot now. And I didn't even understand, uh, I didn't even know what that, I was like, oh, hot now donuts, okay. I go in there and they have a conveyor belt and they're just bubbling and soaking in that hot oil. And then they come out on this little, uh, like a conveyor belt and, and icing would just be dripping. I wanted to lay on that conveyor belt and all oh, it was just amazing. And they get, uh, they would go underneath this before they would even get to the ending the, the the guy or girl would hand one of those donuts over the counter, right? To, and it was so hot and juicy. And this big old donut would just melt into almost nothing. It was so good. I could eat like a dozen of those things. I remember driving by that place sometimes and that hot now sign wasn't on. And so I'd find reasons to go, well, I'll just swing into Target for a second and go look for this and oh, I'll go over to that store that all of a sudden that hot now sign was up and let me tell you I was in that long line with all those people so we have a tendency to lead ourselves into temptation we play with things and some of them are just like that it like it's no big deal although a lifetime of Krispy Kreme donuts and 20 extra pounds now I've got high cholesterol right we have a tendency to toy with things I'll just look just a little bit uh, just two or three drinks. It's okay. I'll know when to stop after that. I had a friend who gave me a wine saver that when the, the wine gets done, he pulls out the, the, uh, the oxygen and it helps that wine save. Well, I've never had to open that because I've never had leftover wine. I, that's probably, uh, yeah, we'll pray about and talk about that later. By the way, let me go back to my example on, this, on Wednesday when I came to the church and I said that I, I just had a salad that afternoon. Um, well, I had a meeting at another church that Wednesday night and I thought, you know what? I just need a little snack before I go to that next meeting. So I went to Tupanumbas just down the street, some Mexican food restaurant um, right at 75 and Walnut Hill Lane in Dallas, Texas. Oh my gosh, it is so good. And I went there and I, uh, they set a bowl of uh, chips. They brought out their great homemade salsa that they had, and I just tore into it. I had no self-control. Oh, it was so good, though. But what are we praying? Lead us, Lord. Lead me in your path. Lead me in the paths of righteousness for your namesake. So when we ask Jesus to lead us, listen, we're asking him to lead us and typically to lead us away from the things that we wrestle with from anger, from bigotry, hate, indifference, gossip, drugs, power, money, pleasure. God says, I have a better way for you than this. And again, we have to decide. He wants to lead us, but he won't force us. So he waits for us to invite him. Like if you don't ever invite him, he's not going to come along. He's not going to come alongside. He's not going to try and lead you if you're not willing to be led. So when I'm saying lead us, in the essence, I'm saying when I call Jesus Lord, the word Lord is master, sovereign, ruler. He's like the captain of your ship. And I'm simply saying, Lord, lead me. Be the Lord over my life. Put me on the right path. You know how I struggle. So Lord, lead me today. Take another listen to Adam Hamilton. So that leads me to this last little statement in the prayer and deliver us from evil. Uh, deliver us. The word deliver is a really great word. It, uh, it's a word in Greek that signifies swooping up and picking you up and, and delivering you. It's saving you or rescuing you. Rusai is the word, and I think it's the Greek, et uh, the etymology behind the word rush. And so it's like God rushed to me and picked me up, swoop me up and save and deliver me. Because sometimes I am heading in a direction that's wrong. So Lord, lead me not into temptation. But when I get too close or when I've made a mess of my life or I've actually gone ahead and done the thing I didn't want to do or I shouldn't have done, please swoop in and rescue me. We have a little dog. Her name is Maybelle. She's a uh, combination chihuahua and pug. She's a chug. And she's just as sweet as can be. She looks like a miniature Doberman pincher. So <clears throat> yesterday, uh, Levon, we had a bunch of family who were in town uh, for a wedding. 
And uh, LaVon was, uh, was leaving the house, and I was getting to the house. And as LaVon was leaving, M- Mabel got out, and as she got out, she saw LaVon's car, and, she's, you know, and she began to run across the front yard towards the street where LaVon was, was driving to. And uh, LaVon's sister Karen saw her, and she began to run frantically because she realized LaVon probably wouldn't see her, and she was running so fast she could run right underneath the car and be killed by the car. Just be horrible. And so Karen begins running as fast as she can. And when I, you know, and LaVon had just passed. And when I got there, uh, Karen had, she was panting and she had Maybell in her arms holding her tight. And I said, what happened, Karen? What happened? She said, well, Maybell got out and she began to run. And I was afraid she'd get run over by the car. And, and I swooped up and I grabbed her right at the last minute. And I think that's really what this prayer is in essence saying. Rush to me and swoop me up and save me, Lord. Deliver me from the mess I've made or the mess I could be making or the horrible things that could happen if I kept going in my path and not yours. Listen, my friend who made a mess of his life cried out to God, please help me and deliver me. But you still live with the consequences of the mess you make sometimes. Like just because God forgives you doesn't mean the consequences aren't there. He's not a pastor and he's not married anymore. And, But God said, you know what, I'm also the God of the second chance. I can help you, and I will, and I love you, and I know you made a mess of things, but I can help you put it back together again, if you'll let me. He still does that for us. So I'd end with this. We are going to be tempted. That's a part of the human condition. It means you're alive. And that tempting, when we resist it, became a test that we survived, right? And it made us stronger. And sometimes we give into it and we need God's rescue and God's deliverance. I've shared the story with you before, but a Native American grandfather who was telling his grandson about this wrestling that we have with temptation, how all of us have these two voices we hear, the Spirit's voice, the Holy Spirit's voice leading us or longing to lead us in the paths of righteousness, and then the dark side that will lead us away from that. And, and so he likened it to his grandson. He said, it's like there are two wolves that live inside of you. So there's a good wolf, a compassionate and kind wolf that wants to be protective and care for and, and do the right thing. And then there's another wolf living inside of you and he wants to, he wants to devour and to destroy and, and to do what's wrong and evil. And the little grandson said, well, Papa, which, which wolf is going to win out? Which wolf is going is, is to you know, have a hold of me? And he said, whichever one you feed. Part of what we do here when we gather on Sundays is we come to feed the good wolf, right? We come to feed the Holy Spirit. We come to invite the Holy Spirit to remind us of who we are and what we're meant to be and then, and then invite God to lead us. And part of what we pray when we pray the Lord's Prayer, and you remember they prayed it three times a day in the early church, in the morning and in the early afternoon and again at night. Part of what we pray every day when we pray this is lead us, Lord. Lead us, lead me where you want me to go. And not into the path I might lead myself, and deliver me from what's painful and hard and hurtful. That's what we're praying when we pray this line. I've been raised in the perfect surroundings. Go to church once a week, sometimes two. Lord, I want to be what you want me to be. Often sin represents all I do.
So I'd like to close by this. I'd like to ask you to simply, even right there at home uh, or wherever you're at, if you're driving your car, don't do this. But if you're at home right now, just to simply put your, your hands out there in front of you. And I want to invite you just to, to whisper to God. If you're struggling with some kind of temptation in some way, which I know that we all are, but for you to say, Lord, this is what I'm struggling with most. Please lead me and help me not to give in. So just take a moment and take it before God, whatever's on your heart. And now, to ask God to deliver you, to rescue you, to rush to you and to, to pick you up, to swoop you up like Adam said, and to save you from whatever you may have done in the past or what you might be contemplating doing. Just ask God to deliver you from evil, from pain, from hurt. And now, I want us to pray the Lord's Prayer together. It's gonna to be right up here on the screen in front of you. And remember, we have that new comma in there, so it's gonna take a little bit of time for us to learn this new one together. Would you say it with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And we're gonna stop right there. Next week, we're gonna talk about that next phrase. I'm just gonna give you one little clue. When Jesus taught us this prayer, the accounts were written in, in Matthew and in John, and this is where the prayer 
stops. This Jesus never said the, the next part of the prayer. We're going to talk about where that came from and when it was added. And so I hope you will join in with us this next week. Uh, I'll, if you have missed any of the series, I encourage you to go back on our YouTube channel or on Facebook and watch uh, the whole series. Uh, it's, uh, I hope it's uh, as meaningful and impactful for you as it has been for me. Well, we want you to know this from the Preston Hollow family. We want you to know that we love you and that more importantly, God loves you absolutely with no exceptions. Have a great week.
Well, we want to say thank you again for watching today. If this broadcast, if this service, uh, the online community of Preston Hollow uh, is of value to you, we want to encourage you to, to simply give. And on the screen, you can just see, I'm just going to point all those out to you. But I hope that you'll give with a generous heart. And, uh, you know, we're uh, ministering and partnering with the Life Pack Initiative. Um, right now, we've raised over $5,000 to give Life Packs to homeless people. And so if you want to give towards that as well, give a special offering today. You see the QR code on the screen. Um, you can also write a check and put it in the mail to 6315 Walnut Hill Lane, Dallas, Texas, 75230. Or just simply text us to the number 77977 and type in the words P-H-U-M-C. Well, uh, again, thank you for partnering with us. We want you to know that we love you. Don't forget, next week, the, uh, the, we're wrapping up uh, the, uh, the, the series on the Lord's Prayer. Then we have a special guest, Mr. Mike Bachman uh, from the Union Coffee uh, Ministry in, uh, here in Dallas, Texas. He's going to be speaking that week. We're excited to have him. Then the weekend after that, the weekend after Labor Day, our choir is doing an entire cantata uh, dedicated to the Lord's Prayer. We're going to be recapping the whole thing, and they're going to do all six songs that they sang uh, during this series. So if you're in Dallas, and join us for worship. We meet on Sunday mornings at 1030. Well, uh, thanks again for watching. We'll know that we love you and God loves you absolutely with no exceptions. Have a great week. God bless.